and welcome to TL Physics and today I'm going to talk about how we are able to detect the exoplanets. So exoplanets are planets that live um, in different solar systems around different stars and we're able to detect them using two very distinct methods. <clears throat> the first one is the simplest. It's the idea that a star gives off light and if a planet goes in front of it the amount of light that we would receive from it would actually diminish. And with technology now, we're able to detect that slight change in luminosity. So what I've got here is I've got my star, and I've got this little planet that will go in front of the star, and it will orbit around, and then it will come back. So this is the star's luminosity. And then what will happen is the planet goes over it, that luminosity would dip, and it will go back to maximum around the back, and of course it would come back again. Okay, so what I can actually do from this information is <coughs> I can work out the time period it takes for one orbit of that planet. And using Kepler's laws, that t squared is proportional to the radius cube, which you've learned at um, gravitational fields. Because I know the time period of the orbit, I could then work out the gravitational um, the, look at the gravitational work at the star and then work out the radius that that planet is orbiting, that exoplanet. Which is why we're looking at planets in what we call the Goldilocks zone, which is supposedly the region where it could sustain life like us on Earth. So that is one method, and this is known as the luminosity method. So as a star that goes across, a, a planet goes across a star, the luminosity will dip slightly and we're able to measure that slight bit of dip to actually work out the time period of that oscillation. Now the other one is a slightly different technique and we can use it uh, for objects being pulled towards us, especially bigger stars. So what I've got here is I've got Earth, I've got this planet and I've got a star. And what happens is that, as we know, with gravitational pull, is that we planets exert the force on the star as much as the star exerts force on the planet. So what actually happens is when it's in this orientation, the, plant, the star here is actually pulled slightly towards us. If a star is moving towards us, we will actually notice a slight bit from its normal um, emission. We will actually notice a slight change in the absorption spectra. We would actually say the absorption spectra is slightly blue shifted towards its normal, um, than its normal actually absorption spectra. Whereas when it comes backwards here, when the star planet is behind the star from Earth, we actually notice that the planet will pull it backwards a little bit. So we'd not notice a slight bit of redshift from its normal um, actual spectra. So what we actually get is a graph that would look like this. It would be slightly blue shifted here, and then we go down to its normal spectra, and then it would be slightly red shifted, and then we'll go back up again. And of course, from this, you can work out the actual time period of the orbit of the actual satel uh, the satellite, the planet itself. So using red and blue shift, we're actually able to find these exoplanets. And then using Kepler's law of planetary motion, we can actually work out the radius that planet is orbiting. Exoplanets are sort of the forefront of physics, looking at where we could inhabit in the few, th when, how long time, if we're going to leave our solar system, and uh, understanding if we can find new life. So that there are the two methods of being able to detect and search for exoplanets.